created in secret is to transform the world as always planned and has been in my books all these years is to transform the world into a corporation controlled society where corporations who have far far more resources and money and wealth than um, most governments um, they uh, will have the ability to go to a world corporate court and take governments um, to court for doing things that um, the corporations don't like. What is being negotiated are laws of copyright that are so outrageous, so extreme, so mind-blowing in the idea that they could even be considered, never mind agreed. But as um, a, a story on my website in the last few days pointed out, um, if certain things go ahead, and not just within the trade deals, but within the European Union, um, and they're all connected, of course, it's all part of the same web of centralised control, um, that even taking pictures of things that you own could be breach of copyright and find yourself in legal action. They're stitching up the world. That's what these trade deals are doing. And the idea is to negotiate them in secret, pass them through as quick as possible through the um, parliaments and Congress that they become law of the land before anyone's really cottoned on to what it means. And we saw this with the, um, the European Union. You know, things would be passed through and passed through and passed through and it would be covered by the media. Oh, yeah, this, this has been passed or that's been passed. Oh, yeah, well, what was it? Well, no debate that people have any say in um, and contributing to. And then people go down the shops or they go about their work and they say, what do you mean? We, we can't do this anymore. Well, that's banned. That's illegal. What's, what's happened? What's happened? Well, what's happened? It's all been done in secret. And it's been pushed through very, very quickly. So now it's law of the land and you are subjected to it with, without you even realising it's happened until you're faced with it. This is what's planned with these uh, trade deals. And um, they are um, chilling in what they um, plan to introduce. And, you know, I, I have felt, um, and I've said for a long time, that um, 2016, 2017, 2018 are going to decide the long-term future of human society. They really are. And... Um, we must start um, making all this the priority of our lives. Because if we put anything before it, even, even family, family occasions, whatever, if something else needs doing, we may think we're doing the right thing in the short term, but in the longer term, we're not. Um, the work that I do means that I miss things, family things that um, others would, would, would not miss but my um, attitude is this my biggest contribution to for instance my grandkids and my, my children is to do everything I can to head off and alert people so it's headed off um, what is planned for this world and what's unfolding by the day. That's my big biggest contribution and that's my focus. And so if I have to miss this family occasion or that family occasion because um, this is something I have to do to advance that, um, 
that, that goal that I have, then that will have to happen. Because when, when, if, should, my grandkids, for instance, say to me some time from now, what were you doing, granddad, when, um, when all this was coming in? I don't want to have to say nothing, but I did attend the school play. I want to say everything I bloody could, darling. And that is, I would suggest, where, where we need to go from here as we move towards 2016. Make this the priority. Because if we don't, then um, we'll take the consequences. But I am very, very optimistic that we are starting to move towards um, a point where the numbers of people in, in awareness that the world's not like they thought it was is starting to reach a point where it can have some kind of impact. And that's why in 2016, 2017, 2018, my feet are not going to move. Because this, this is the epicenter of um, heading this off, these next three years, starting now. And the more that can be involved in that, the more that can look and say, how do I contribute and do it, the more um, likely, obviously, it is that this will be headed off. And uh, I've not worked this last 25, 26 years full-time constantly on this. The question is, how did I know that? And the answer to that question puts current events into their true perspective. First of all, forget countries, forget individual countries, forget individual leaders. What you have, and I've exposed this in such detail in my books uh, over decades, what you have is a hidden hand that works through governments, no matter what party is in government, they're always there. They're the constant. They work through secret societies and semi-secret groups and through agencies and organisations that we actually see in the public arena but don't know the real background to. And they have had a long-term plan for this world and the human race. And it is to create... A global fascist communist, call it what you like, same bloody thing in the playing out. A global fascist communist Orwellian state of total control involving a world government, world central bank, world army, microchipped um, population and then some. World single currency, uh, cashless, no physical money. I'm talking about that for 25 years. Look, look what's happening. And part of this plan of transforming the world into this global police state and centralised tyranny is a series of wars. There's nothing that changes a society more than a war. And if you want to change global society, you need global wars. Look how fewer hands power was in after the First World War than it was before. And again, pushing it on, how that continued after the Second World War. And there's always been a plan for a third world war 
to complete the process of creating a centralized global dictatorship in the end uh, justified by we must stop this ever happening again. What you're not being told is that those who will say that are the ones that have created all the mayhem to justify the transformation of global society. So what I'll do now is just put together a few pieces to put current events into context. In the year 2000, in September 2000, there was an organization in America called the Project for the New American Century. It was peopled by those who came in uh, shortly afterwards to the Bush administration when it took power in early 2001. They included people like Cheney, who became vice president, president in truth. And Rumsfeld became defense secretary. Wolfowitz, who became deputy defense secretary, but was actually the real defense secretary. And a stream of others who came into significant positions of power in the Pentagon and elsewhere with the Bush administration in 2001. And um, they included a long list of uh, prominent Zionists with fundamental connections to Israel. The reason that is significant is that in September 2000, this organization produced a document calling for the American administration and military to embark upon regime change after regime change in country after country, fighting what they called multi-theater wars. These countries included Iraq, Libya, Syria, Iran, etc. and also called for regime change in China. Oh, that'll be interesting. The people behind that document then came to power in early 2001 with the Bush administration. Now, that document in September 2000 said that this process of transformation, this regime change, regime change, regime change, would be slow, quote, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. One year to the month later, after they were now in power, America had what Bush called our Pearl Harbor, 9-11. As a result of that, inside job, the official story is a fairy story, the process of picking off countries on the list began with of course Iraq we've had and Libya and Syria now and it goes on so let's go to Iraq Shortly after 9-11, matter of days, General Wesley Clark, former Supreme Commander of NATO, told a television program in 2007, he said that a few days after 9-11, he went to the Pentagon and he met Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and all these characters. And then he met a general that he knew. And 
he was told that they were going to invade Iraq. And of course, Clark is taken aback. What do you mean you're going to invade Iraq? Why? The guy didn't seem to know because of compartmentalization. He probably didn't know. And a little while after that, not long, after America was now in Afghanistan, Clark went back to the Pentagon and met that same general. And Clark says to him, and, you know, go on the Internet, put a few keywords in and you can watch the interview. Clark said to him, why aren't we invading Iraq? You said we we're going to invade Iraq. And the general said, it's worse than that, sir. And he pulled out a document from a drawer. And he said, we've just had this down from upstairs. In other words, Rumfeld's office. And that they were going to invade seven countries in five years. Among them, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Iran. And so they started to pick the list off. And of course, there was Iraq. The idea was to invade Iraq, but there was no um, reason to do that. This brings us to Tony Blair and George Bush and the infamous, blatantly mendacious, sexed up dossier talking about the threat of weapons of mass destruction from Iraq and Saddam Hussein that has now been exposed as a complete pack of lies. While Bush and Blair were saying right up to the Iraq invasion in 2003, it could still be stopped if Saddam Hussein will get rid of the weapons of mass destruction, which he didn't have. It's now known that Blair agreed with Bush on that invasion a year earlier. And I've shown in my books years ago now, in fact, in 2003, that it goes back even further. What was happening and why they needed the lie of weapons of mass destruction was they had this list of countries for regime change and acquisition and they needed excuses. They go into Afghanistan. Oh, get Bin Laden. He was behind 9-11. What, from a cave in Afghanistan? Then Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction. And in they go. And at around the same time, a weapons inspector called David Kelly, Dr. David Kelly, um, told a BBC reporter that that dossier justifying the invasion had been sexed up. In other words, it was full of bloody lies. And this was very dangerous to this lie to justify the invasion of Iraq to pick it off the list. So he committed suicide. He committed suicide as much as I committed suicide yesterday. He was murdered, taken out. And the reason he was taken out and the reason the official story of his suicide is so ludicrous and shot full of holes is because he was taken out because he had the knowledge as a weapons inspector who had been to Iraq many times to know that it was all a scam. So, Iraq picked off. Untold numbers of people, dead, slaughtered, maimed. A country torn asunder. And if you think, just contemplate, the number of dead people 
that have resulted from the lies of Bush and Blair and the people behind them, where the real power is, it is unspeakable. And all this chaos that has followed on purpose, come to that, is the result of that same pack of lies from Blair and Bush. And far from making their millions since they left politics, they should both be under lock and key for the rest of their lives with a key thrown mid-Atlantic. Let's look at the list. Ah, Libya. Well, at that one now. You keep um, giving the same excuse war invasion after war invasion, then people are going to go, hold on a second, what's going on? So you keep changing it, or changing it a bit. So what you do then, you want to get rid of Gaddafi in um, Libya. So what you do is you train, arm and fund um, freedom fighters, better known as terrorists, to start attacking the Gaddafi regime. And when he responds, you say that Gaddafi is killing his own people and to protect them from violence you have to go in and bomb the shit out of it including all those civilian areas go on the internet go onto a, an image find um, search engine and put in Libyan um, devastation destruction whatever from NATO bombing or worse to that effect and see how the people of Libya were protected from violence. These people are not just psychopaths, they're super psychopaths and they're running our world and we need to take it back from them. So, Iraq was left in devastated, catastrophic chaos, violence, upheaval. Libya was left in chaos, violence and catastrophic upheaval. And they moved on to Syria. And they did the same job. They funded, armed and trained uh, freedom fighters of the so-called Free Libyan Army moderates, they're moderate yeah they kill people moderately in very large numbers and they started attacking the Assad regime in Syria same script this time and Assad responded he's killing his own people and so uh, these terrorists were funded, armed, well documented now, funded, armed and trained by the West to clear America on behalf of the hidden hand. And all this mayhem and violence has unfolded. Al-Qaeda, which was the organization blamed for 9-11 and connected to Osama bin Laden and Afghanistan that justified them going in there actually was the creation of the United States Al-Qaeda stands for the base or the database and it uh, comes from the database of Mujahideen fighters uh, funded and armed by the Americans to fight against the Russians in Afghanistan. And Sir Big New Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's former national security advisor, who is part of this hidden hand cabal, has actually admitted that he funded and armed and all the rest of it, the Mujahideen, which became Al-Qaeda. So we fight Al-Qaeda, but well we don't, these psychopaths do, or soldiers on their behalf, they never fight anybody.
sipping bloody coffee in Washington and Downing Street, saying, we're going to fight the terrorists. No, you're not. You ain't going anywhere. You're going to send other poor buggers to do it. So here we have um, a situation where this Al-Qaeda, the creation of the United States, um, and they, they use it then to fight um, in the Middle East because Al-Qaeda is dangerous terrorists. And then these Al-Qaeda characters are involved in the fight against Gaddafi. So now, now they're not so, so bad. And then they move into um, Syria under names like Al-Nusra and stuff. And, and, and the whole thing morphs into ISIS, another creation, outgrowth of the Western creation of terrorism to justify the invasion of countries and to justify, through terrorist attacks, the destruction of freedom at home. But what's happened is they were held up by Assad. Assad didn't go as quickly as they thought he would. They thought he'd go about the same time as Gaddafi. And it's gone on and on and on, and they've not been able to remove Assad and take over the, the country. And they had another problem in that Russia was supporting Assad. And it reached the point recently where clearly Putin could see where this was going. The United States and others, Turkey, what have you, France, was supposed to be um, bombing ISIS in Syria all this time um, to destroy the terrorists. But they haven't been. They've just been getting stronger. And, of course, what anyone with a brain cell could see, and certainly Putin could, is they weren't trying to remove ISIS, because they wanted ISIS, they created ISIS to remove Assad. They want to destroy him. So Russia go in to Syria, invited by Assad, the only people bombing who have been, and they start bombing ISIS and meaning it. And suddenly ISIS start to get on the run. Woo! That's bloody bad news. That's the last thing we want. And here it is, the Russians now supporting Assad. We've, we've done all this to get rid of him. Oh, what's going on? He's spawning a party here. And so we had the tax in Paris, immediately followed by the taking down of the Russian plane by Turkey on the most outrageous um, with the most outrageous uh, excuse, clearly premeditated. And look at where we are now, because there's different levels of this. And deep, deep in the rabbit hole, where the hidden hand is well beyond the, the knowledge of at least most of these players, they have the very circumstances that I've been talking about all these years for the start of World War III. They have now, on one side, the United States, the rogue state of Turkey, they have France, and of course Cameron is desperately now and seems to be getting support from these idiotic Labour MPs who won't listen to the common sense of their leader. They want Britain bombing in there as well. So there you have NATO. And what is the plan? To pitch NATO against Russia and China. So you have Russia now in Syria with warplanes and they're bringing more um, high-tech, state-of-the-art equipment in as a result of the downing of this plane. They're also supported, as sad is, by China 
and it was the plan was and is for a third world war involving NATO against Russia and China and also in there is another target on the list Iran supporting Assad so you have this powder keg situation that has miraculously unfolded as I've been talking about it would in the light of their plans for years and years it's unfolded like this because it's all been planned from the start and of course the demonization of Russia started with Ukraine. Ukraine was um, subjected to the latest United States organized coup to remove an elected leader, not a nice man, no, how many of them are? But an elected leader. And in was put this guy, Poroshenko. WikiLeaks have um, revealed um, communications showing that he was an insider for the United States in Ukraine for years and years before. So they put their man in and they start the demonization of uh, Russia and um, that's been followed by what's happened since. Do you know who orchestrated the, the uh, coup and the handing over of power to America's man in Ukraine, a lady called Victoria Newland, assistant um, secretary for European and Eurasian affairs at the US State Department. Do you know who her husband is? Robert Kagan, co-founder of the project for the new American century. It's a movie. And you Labour MPs better get your fricking asses in gear. Start using some brain cell activity. Start doing some bloody research and realise that you are being had again not by a new war, but by the continuation of the same war on human freedom and human liberty. And you know, we've had Blair, Labour Party, does what he did. Now we have his opponent, whoa, Debbie Cameron. Conservative Party doing exactly the same, continuing the same script. In America, we had George Bush, Republican, did what he did. And now we have President Obama, Democrat, opponent, whoa, doing the same. You know why nothing changes except that? Because they're all masks on the same face. And when that penny drops human race, we might have a chance of sorting this out. Well, I'm going to do uh, some questions this week, lots of them on loads of different subjects. But I'll start with um, a kind of question area that came from three or four people which was, um, why don't you give us solutions? Why do you always talk about what's wrong and not what to do about it? Well, I found that interesting over the, um, the decades that I've been doing this because you talk about solutions, as they're called, but it kind of 
passes a lot of people by because it's not what they want to hear. When people talk about solutions, it's like we must do A, B, C and D. We must uh, have a meeting. We must take minutes and stuff like that. But as I'll get into, um, there's no solutions coming from there. The action that we take comes from the attitudes we have, the perceptions we have, and how willing we are to take personal responsibility for what's happening instead of passing it on to other people. And uh, in terms of talking about positive things, what is more positive than what I've been pointing out all these years? That we are not our bodies we are not our names and our life stories. They are our experiences. We are infinite awareness, a state of being aware. How aware is the decision we make on what we allow our perceptions to be? But beyond the beyond the manipulation of perception, we are still infinite awareness, having experiences. We are still eternal awareness. There is no death just leaving the vehicle, the body. I mean, how much positivity do you want than that? And this is, a, this is one that I had. And some, some were very nice and very respectful and, and, and one or two others weren't. But I'm used to that. It's a guy who calls himself Stevie Sleuth. Why are you so addicted to fear and use that to promote yourself? How about working on solutions instead of the problems? Now that, after a quarter of a century of this, is a classic. First of all, um, do I look addicted to fear? If anyone should be frightened after what I've um, uncovered over the years, it should be me. But I'm not frightened. And it's funny how people relate fear to uncovering things that we need to know about. Because if we don't know about them, and therefore do not have the, at least the opportunity to do something about it, then they go on happening. And if you look around the world and you look at all the expressions of this global network that I'm exposing in terms of the horrors and the reasons to fear, well, that's what happens when these things unfold with most people have no idea why they're happening or, or what's behind it, except what the mainstream media has told them. And so, if people choose to be in fear of what is uncovered about what is behind them, well, that's their problem. And it's their decision. You can look at it in fear, oh my God, or you can say, fantastic now I'm starting to get an understanding of what's happening and what's behind it and the methods that uh, are used to manipulate me so thus I can be a lot less manipulated than I was before that's a great thing that's one way of looking at this information as it comes to light another one is oh my god shut up you're frightening people well, stick around if, if you're talking about frightening people and see what's happening. Get even closer to its its uh, planned end. And then there's this um, idea that exposing the problem can be somehow divorced from doing something about it. I've always found that very weird. Personally, um, 
Okay, uh, I've got some solutions. Oh yeah, what for? For what's happening? Well, what's happening? Well, I can't tell you, or I'll be promoting myself through fear and frightening people. Can't tell you, but here's some solutions. What are you talking about? How can you have solutions to something you don't know what you do, you, what's going on? I, I, go away. So, a massive, massive part of bringing an end to this global manipulation and its endless faces and facets is to expose A, that it's going on, B, what's behind it, and see the methods of manipulation it uses so we stop being manipulated to do its will, believing that we're not. It's, um, it's extraordinary. How do you change something if you don't know what needs changing? How can you stop being manipulated by something if you don't know that something exists and you don't know how it manipulates so massively part of the addressing of what's going on is to know what there is to be addressed. And then there's this idea I, I get from, from some people here and there. Um, oh, well, you know, you said that before. Uh, I've heard that. And? Your point is, there are billions of people in this world, billions of people, who have not had access to any other explanation of the world and world events than the mainstream. And so, what, what we need to do to challenge that is to say things once and put things out once and then that will sort it won't it those who are really um, committed to making a difference keep putting this information out in different forms in different ways over and over and over and over again because they know that there's vast, vast, the vast majority of people in the world have never had access to it. So you keep putting it out, and every time you put it out, you, you get someone else who, who hasn't seen it before. Oh, no, I've heard that. See? Me, me, me. Another expression of the me-centric world. Okay, you, you've heard it. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'll wait for you to give us some solutions. Hey, eh? we go round and bloody round. We um, we tend not to um, like hearing solutions that involve personal responsibility, and thus they kind of go through, don't register. See, it never gives any solutions, and anyway. The world is drowning in solutions that lead to other problems that then demand other solutions. Wouldn't it be a good idea if we, um, if we moved, removed the cause of the problem? I think that would be more effective. So what is the problem? It is the program, as I call it. It's the programmed perceptions of the human population who have been systematically... Um, put before that programming and subject to that programming from the moment they entered the world until the moment they leave it through education and the media and all these things, science and medicine, all these expressions of the system that are telling you what is, what isn't, what's possible, what's not possible, what's credible, what's not. And when you challenge these assumptions of the system, then they just fall before your eyes. 
and you suddenly realize that the very nature of who we are, the very nature of reality itself is being systematically kept from us and we're being sold a fake one. A fake one that gets us to self-identify with our name as who we are, with our body as who we are, with our life story as who we are, our sex who we are, our colour, race as who we are, where they're just experiences for the real self, which is infinite awareness having that experience. It's that infinite awareness, a state of being aware, that near-death experiences talk about experiencing when they leave the body and they leave the lens, the vehicle, the biological computer that is decoding reality in a certain way. I mean, just think about it. The, the, the particles that make up your body actually exist in many places at the same time. They actually have no single location. The, the world that we think uh, exists and is so real and we have to find solutions within is merely a construct in the brain. A, a, a small part of the brain that decodes information into visual information, electrical information into visual information. There is no out there as we perceive it. It's all going on in here. When information is decoded, like a computer decoding the Wi-Fi, and what information we decode and the range of information we decode and the understanding that we decode depends on our own perceptions. If we have pea-sized perceptions of everything and pea-sized perceptions of ourself, I'm just little me, what can I do? I've got no power. Then collectively, we are ripe for control by the few and that's what's happened. And if we don't open our minds and much else besides and see beyond the program, see beyond the reality that we downloaded all our lives and the sense of limitation, the sense of I can't, the sense that this physical five sense world is all that is, exists, when in fact it only exists in a decoded part of the brain, then we'll live in a certain kind of world that is open to be controlled by a few of a certain kind of people. If we perceive the world to be uh, a series of different uh, races, different religions, different everything, then we can be manipulated into being divided and ruled between all those fault lines. I don't like you because you've got a different religion to me. I don't like you, you're a different colour to me. And all this bloody nonsense. I don't like you because you've said something that's just upset me. I want to save space then we'll live in a certain kind of world and be open to, easily open, to mass manipulation and mass control. Or, we can look in the mirror, or look beyond the program. And we can not only accept the concept that we are awareness having an experience, infinite awareness having an experience, but actually live from that perspective. That, not that I'm David Icke, it's my experience currently, but that I am infinite awareness having that experience. And um, I could tell you from my own personal life and that of others I know and have met over the years, that when you move that point of 
self-identity from I am my body, my name, my income bracket, my background, my race, my religion to I am infinite awareness having that experience. That movement of point of attention from the fragment of infinite awareness to a much greater um, swathe of it transforms not only your ability to see the world for what it is, it also transforms your perceptions of everything and your understanding of how you personally can make a contribution to making a difference in what we call solutions. And when people say, tell me what to do, tell us what to do, give us some solutions. That's the program speaking. Because when you go beyond what I call phantom self into a self-identity with infinite self, infinite awareness, then you know yourself how you can contribute and what you should do or could do to contribute to making a difference and not only that you have this passionate desire to do it and so many use well what can we do give us some solutions as an excuse not to do anything so the solution and the problem are indivisible but people see one and see the other. And, um, you know, if you're looking for solutions within a world that you think is solid, within a world you think is physically real, when actually it's just a decoded um, sense of reality in your brain, then where do you start? Where do you start finding solutions in a reality that's not even the reality you think it is? This world is a, is a, is a projection. It's a projection of something from the unseen, energetic information, perceptions, emotions, that, that are projected from the unseen into this illusory physical reality. You're not going to find solutions to anything in, within this reality because it's just a movie. You're not going to find uh, ways of changing the movie uh, on a movie screen. You can complain all you like about the movie. It's, the movie's the movie. You've got to go and find where the movie's being projected from and then you change the movie because the movie has to change if what it's projected from changes. And that means changing ourselves. It means looking in the mirror and saying, how am I contributing to what I want to challenge? You know, people um, talk about um, what are the solutions and you see them on the internet and social media. Re really vicious, aggressive well, you're doing this, you're doing that with solutions. They're not all like that. Some are you know, very respectful. Like I said, you get that. And that is classically part of the problem. This disunity, this desire to abuse, this um, classic divide and rule that people contribute to all the time almost without exception. Everybody gets pulled into it so, in some level. Well, that's adding to the problem. So if we stop doing it, then we're adding to the solution or removing the problem and thus changing the way the problem manifested. If we stopped... Um, abusing each other and fighting each other over religion and race and gender. Not a bloody vehicle for divide and rule. That is now. 
then we're contributing to the change that needs to take place to stop what we don't like happening. And it's a choice, really, ironically, from what Stevie Sleuth said. It's a choice in the end between fear and love. Not love in the sense of attraction, but love in the, the greater infinite sense. And we can make that choice whenever we like. We can look at information coming to light and we can say, that's frightening. Shut up. So you're giving it to fear. And where's that going to take us? Except deeper into what we don't like. Or you can come from a point of love in its infinite sense. Not I love you, darling, saw you down the disco. Love. Love that expresses itself far more through friendship than through physical attraction friends are normally always there no matter what those physically attracted and what we call love often are not there when they're needed and so coming from that point of love it's okay you have that religion that's fine as long as you don't pose on anyone else you have that religion, that's fine, as long as you don't pose anyone else. You have that race, you have that race, well, okay, they're just vehicles for infinite awareness, we're all the same infinite awareness, they're just vehicles. You have that opinion, fine, I don't agree with it, but you have a right to have it. Oh, you want to say that? Well, I don't agree with what you're saying, but if I believe in free speech, then I agree that you should be able to say it. And then it can be debated. And so on and so on and so on it goes. All these things that are solutions staring us in the face. And, um, but they pass people by because they want, they want a list. And minutes and stuff, like I say. The solutions are in the mirror. But how many people want to look there? How many people, when they realise that they could take responsibility and they could make contributions to um, circulating information that would give people a, the fix on what's going on, but they won't do it. And they won't do it because they, they don't want the consequences of doing it. They don't want the abuse. They don't want the dismissal. They don't want the ridicule. Well, don't do it then. But then don't say to me, where are the solutions? Because there they are, but don't want to go there. You know, when you when you wake up to um, another view of life, another understanding of what's actually happening behind all that appears to be happening, there's a responsibility in that as well. You know, th 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 that information is no good if it just stays with the one person. And they stand on the other side of the street saying, yeah, I knew that was going to happen because that, uh, yeah, well, where, where's that taking us? Nowhere. And we need to move to um, the next stage of all this where people not only um, get a, a, a bigger understanding of what's going on, but then say, okay, well, how do I contribute to making a difference to it? And, and how am I making a difference or how, how am I making a contribution to it at the moment, which I don't, I, I could change my behavior and attitudes and not then make. It's, um, it's a time when um, people need to, uh, to find the mirror and say, what am I doing? How am I contributing to the problem? How am I contributing to a solution to the problem? Instead of dismissing amazing, fantastic, extraordinarily importantly um, needed information coming to light as frightening people, and then saying externally, where are the solutions? Well, where are your solutions? I might say to those people.
terms of um, positivity, like I said earlier, um, how more positive can it be than to realise the idea of death is a myth, to control us, to frighten us, ironically. How many people go to mainstream medicine and have horrific treatments just because they fear that if they don't, they'll die. And often they do anyway because of the treatment. Fear of death is a massive controlling mechanism. There is no death. There's just our awareness withdrawing from the vehicle and continue to experience infinity within the wider infinity. I mean, God dear, it's frightening, isn't it? In so many ways, the way we accept things without question, just because they've like always been there, um, is so indicative of the way we accept life in general and information in general. Oh, the media say it, or I learned it at school, or the politicians say it, the scientists say it, the doctors say it. And so much of what we accept as reality is just an unconscious feel, image, for how things are, based on repetition, in effect. And so if you are told as a small child that Christmas is about the birthday of Jesus, and this continues through, especially if you're in a Christian family, then there's a, a good chance that you will consciously or unconsciously relate Christmas to the birthday of Jesus. But when you look at the background and you look at the evidence, that is nonsense. There's nothing to support that at all. And one of the things that I would suggest that we need to do as a, a human race is to start questioning what we have been led to believe, questioning what we're told, and see if it stands up to scrutiny. No matter if it comes from a, a priest or um, a politician, a scientist, me, anybody. Instead of just accepting things, consciously or unconsciously, check it out, see if it stands up, or see if it makes sense to you, rather than just taking it off the peg, off the shelf, as a fully formed belief system. And questions like, um, why, who, when, how, these simple one-word questions, can be devastating to the prevailing perception of, 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 of everything. So when you, um, when you look at Christmas, the idea is that it celebrates the birthday of Jesus, who was born on um, our December the 25th, in a manger in Bethlehem. And that all the things that the biblical story says um, happened. Um, it's interesting that even though um, the New Age mentality kind of dismisses the Christian version of Jesus, they all, uh, all also have their version of, of this figure. It, it, well, it, it did exist like that, but it did exist. Well, and does exist, and all these other New Age stories, I think they call him in the New Age, is it Sananda or something like that? And um, again, it's all just another offshoot of a myth that's gone on for hundreds of years, um, indeed thousands in relation to, to Jesus, and many more in relation to other figures of which all the basic themes and pillars of the Jesus story were also 
attributed to long before anyone had ever heard of Jesus. It's a recurring story that is put into different historical settings and given a different name for the deity. So when we look at Christmas and we think it was kind of a relatively modern thing with the trees and the, the gifts and all that. In fact, it goes way back into antiquity, not least to a festival in Rome to their key god Saturn called Saturnalia. And Saturnalia um, was a festival of um, great debauchery which began um, on December the 17th and ran for a week. And during that period, the Romans decorated trees in their homes, they exchanged gifts, they had holly, they had wreaths, and they had mistletoe. And um, a lot more than kissing went on, on under the mistletoe at um, the time of Saturnalia. And, of course, what happened was that this then was transferred into the Christian belief system. And alongside this Saturnalia was also infused the a deity of Mithra, who was given the birthday in Rome of what has become our December the 25th. It was a midwinter festival. And when you see what the Romans and others said about Mithra, in terms of the background to the deity and the story and all that, it is a mirror of what was later attributed to Jesus. Why? Because in um, 325 um, AD, at the Council of Nicaea, the Roman Emperor Constantine, who worshipped a deity called Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun, um, was involved in the creation, basically, of the structure and belief system of what we call Christianity. And there was a transfer from the previous, what we would call pagan deities and belief systems and worship of Rome, to Christianity. And the reason that Romans and others had little um, difficulty with that transfer is because it was the same belief system, the same story, and it was just given a different, if you like, cover, narrative, and went on as before. And then as the centuries uh, have passed, these former um, pre-Christian pagan festivals, stories, deities, belief systems, became accepted purely by repetition, 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 to be the Christian story, unique to Christianity. It, it's not. It wasn't. And so what we call Christmas, where so many around the world um, believe that they're celebrating the birthday of uh, Jesus, um, Christmas and what they're celebrating is really a modern version of Saturnalia in Rome, um, fused in with the, the worship of pre-Jesus Jesus figures like Mithra, the vine, the only begotten son, all the same um, uh, uh, attributes to the pre-Christian deities. Um, appeared with the later Jesus. They were just transferred. Well, I don't want to change my religion. Well, we're not changing religion. We're just changing the name of the deity. All right, I can handle that. And 
what um, happened is that, for instance, um, in ancient Babylon, they had a, a trinity of Nimrod, the father god, Tammuz, the son, and they said the father and son were one, for reasons I'll come to. And the third point of the Babylonian trinity was Queen Semiramis, or Ishtar, also known as, very relevantly, Ishtar. And they said that when Nimrod died, he became the sun god Baal and impregnated um, Semiramis, Ishtar, with the rays of the sun to give a virgin birth to Tammuz, the sun. And they said that Tammuz was a, an incarnation, a reincarnation of Nimrod, thus father and son were one. And when this belief system was transferred to Rome, at least through the movement of people, the Christian version became the father god, Nimrod, the son, Jesus, virgin born. And the third point of the Christian trinity was the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost that is symbolized as a dove. And one of the symbols for Semiramis Ishtar in Babylon was the dove. And what the new Christianity, I say new, what the rewritten pagan belief system called Christianity um, then did, was take the attributes of um, what the Babylonians gave to um, Semiramis, which was virgin mother, queen of heaven, etc. And they transferred them to the figure of Mother Mary. Mother Mary is a, another version of Semiramis, the goddess, in so many ways. And in this way, Christianity um, was formed, Christianity was created. And there are many people um, who are Christians today who realise this. And they work their way around it to um, explain away why this can be. Because the historical facts, if you look at them, are facts. So they can't say, oh, it's a load of rubbish. Um, so they have to find a narrative to explain it within still believing in the Christianity that they've always believed in. I mean, there was one um, uh, Christian article about the uh, the real background to Christmas that I was reading this week um, that uh, pointed out that um, this whole thing about Jesus' birthday on December 25th um, is just made up because um, nowhere in the Bible does it um, point out um, when this Jesus figure was supposed to be born. And all this thing about um, shepherds watch their flock by night, um, this article pointed out that there are uh, no flocks by night in midwinter in that area of the world. It's too bloody cold. It pretty much ends around October. But even so, they find a way round it to, to protect the belief system. Um, I, I spoke at a, uh, an event once, a mm, long time ago now, and um, there were quite a few Christians there because it wasn't you know, one of my events. I was a speaker at a big event of multiple subjects. And um, the Christians got around me, some of them did, afterwards because I you know, said some of the things I'm saying now. And um, I pointed out to one of these uh, people, a, a lady, um, what I've just said about the background to Jesus and where it came from, and that there were endless other um, deities before Jesus, of which exactly the same basically was said. And
and um, she said that's that, that's not true that's not true and then another Christian guy next to her said actually it is so she thought about it for a minute and she said well well it doesn't matter anyway because the belief system must be protected from all borders and all challenge no matter what the evidence and um, I found this um, article this uh, week um, again a Christian article which is accepting the real background to Christmas and where it came from but again doing the mental gymnastics to protect the belief system and um, it's quite instructive to um, to read really it says um, dear reader isn't it amazing that no one knows the date of the most important birth in the history of mankind? Well, if it didn't take place, not really, mate. We know the birth dates of many famous ancient men, from the Caesars to the Pharaohs, and in fact, in Egypt, birthday celebrations can be documented back to the 13th century BC. So, if Jesus is real, um, and the story is real, and the historical setting is real, so why not the same with Jesus uh, as the, the writer points out uh, or claims is the date of the most important birth in the history of mankind I think there's more to know um, but he says but there is not a single reference in all 66 books of the Bible and not one mention in early church literature pinpointing the date of Christ's birth now Here's the gymnastics coming. Here's the, I'm going to uh, disappear at my own backside and I'm going to take a torch, coming. Obviously, God did not want us to know the date Christ was born! Exclamation mark. We must remember that the Son of God pre-existed from eternity with the Father just like in Babylon. Perhaps for us to affix a date of birth to Christ, who always existed, is to detract from his divinity. One thing is certain, if God wanted the church to celebrate the birth of his son, he would have told us to do so. Uh, reasonable minds, did he just say that? Reasonable minds can only conclude that the reason the Bible is silent on the subject is because it was never God's intention for Christ's birthday to be celebrated. And so you've got Christians who believe the whole story. You've got people like this who see that that whole part of the story is nonsense, but then protect the belief system of Jesus by this sort of thing. And you've got the New Age mentality that dismisses the Jesus story biblically, but, but has, what is it, Sananda, whatever, um, uh, 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 this Christ figure in, in, in New Age belief. Um, it's just different versions of the same uh, belief system download. Being unable to get across that chasm of understanding that not only is parts of it not true, none of it's true. It's all just a repeating historical story and narrative. And then this finishes, um, however, we do celebrate Christ's death. It is through his death and atoning sacrifice that we are reconciled to God and have forgiveness of sin. Every time we partake of the communion of the bread and cup, we are celebrating the death that purchased our redemption. I won't even start with that. But God didn't want us to celebrate Christ's birthday so he didn't tell us um, and that all came in fact from the ancient world the December the 25th midwinter festival period which became Christmas Saturnalia but God did want us to celebrate his death kind of a bit perverse and when when is his death celebrated 
They should celebrate someone's death. I don't know. Maybe it's me. Um, when do we celebrate the death of Jesus? Easter. And Easter comes from the very same source that Christmas does. The ancient pre-Christian world. In Babylon, the goddess was known as Queen Semiramis or Ishtar or Easter. Easter comes from Babylon and uh, the ancient world in general that um, followed a uh, Babylonian type religion. Easter eggs, Babylon. Bunnies, symbol of Semiramis Ishtar, Babylon. Um, hot cross buns come from the pagan world. And so we are constantly um, taking on beliefs because of repetition and because of our, our location and our family and environment. In the sense that, if you are born in the Islamic world, to an Islamic family, you are almost certainly going to become a Muslim and believe in the Muslim religion and the Muslim story. If you are born into a Jewish family and a Jewish community, you are almost certainly going to believe in the stories of Judaism and follow their rituals. And if you're born into a Christian family, there's a very, very good chance you are going to go through your life believing in the Christian story. Indeed, there are people of other religions that believe in the Christian story. It's just a web. So, location and upbringing equals information people download from the earliest ages that then becomes their either conscious or unconscious belief system. And this story of G Jesus, Christmas, Easter, and the way it's accepted to be true when it's not, the way the festivals are believed to be because of this when they're not, is just a classic um, example of how people take on perceptions for no other reason than where they were born, where they were brought up, the environment, in other words, information download to which they were subjected as they were brought up, and the repetition, repetition, repetition of information which becomes a belief system. And if there's um, one New Year's resolution that would change people's lives and change collectively human society, it would be if people stopped taking their beliefs unquestioningly off the shelf, stopped downloading their perceptions from others, and start with a blank sheet of paper and say, anything comes on here has to go through my filter, my research, my feeling, my intuition, whatever. And only then does it get on this piece of paper, in other words, only then do I accept its validity in um, becoming part of my perception. And I tell you what, if people did that on a vast scale, if people did that just individually, 
they would be shocked at how much they have believed consciously and again unconsciously during their life that had no validity whatsoever. And if more do that, then more will see through the perception deception that keeps the human race in such unquestioning servitude. So let's go and um, take some questions. Of, I tell them many and various comments. Um, this is from um, Miki, Mikey, Miki, uh, Ezat. It says, um, "Do you have any information about the so-called Morgellons, and what are your thoughts?" Well, funnily enough, um, I've uh, just had a new book published called "Phantom Self: Brackets and How to Find the Real One." And there's a chapter in that which I think is possibly the most important chapter I've ever written. And um, Morgellons um, is connected into that tapestry. Things like aluminium are, are in them. But what is less talked about, but I talk about in some detail in Fans himself, is they also contain nanotechnology. Um, and nanotechnology is well beyond the ability of anyone to see it it's so small. And it can be breathed in. And what happens with um, sufferers of this condition called Morgellons, which started to appear just as the chemtrails began, is that they have these synthetic... Um, the synthetic material come up through the skin. And um, has a life of its own. It's, it's, um, it, it seems to have the ability to, um, to, to, to think and respond. And they, they, they pull one out that comes through the skin. These fibres, these synthetic fibres. And, and then there's another one, another one. And they replicate. And um, I have um, seen it suggested, and I think this may well be correct, that everyone is breathing this stuff in. And it's being assimilated and absorbed by most people. But what we call sufferers of Morgellons are people whose immune system is rejecting it and fighting it, thus um, we see what happens with Morgellons patients. If you go onto a, a, um, a picture search engine and put in Morgellons disease, then you'll see exactly what I'm talking about and what people are suffering around the world. Um, they have this crawling sensation um, under the skin, um, things moving inside their bodies. I mean, it's extraordinarily horrible. Um, and when you put the pieces together, um, it's very, very clear that what's in chemtrails and Morgellons disease are fundamentally uh, connected. And what I do in Phantom Self is go into why this is happening and what the end goal is of what is happening and that's why I feel it's the most important chapter I've ever written in terms of seeing where all this I won't say multiple conspiracy because in the end it's one conspiracy but this multifaceted global conspiracy is actually designed to go and um it will shock a lot of people, but knowing it is having the ability to avoid it. And that's the whole point of what I do. Not to be proved right. Oh, that David, I've said this. I, 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 I. That is not the goal. The goal is to alert people so that it stops happening. And that's, um, and that's what keeps me going. 
year after year after year. Okay, next one. Um, what are your views concerning remote viewing? That's from Peter Marshall. Um, remote viewing is um, is a fact and, and can be explained. Um, remote viewing came to light when um, government intelligence insiders some time ago now started talking about the fact that they were involved in remote viewing um, projects within the military and within the intelligence uh, networks. And remote viewing relates to being able, for instance, for someone, say me, sitting here now, and to um, project my, what I would call, point of attention, 